All right, well, you say we kick things off here? Sounds good. All right. Cool. Well, uh, hey, welcome to uh, Zach's Corner. Uh, this is the July installment of the Denver Transportation Download. Um, got a very special edition today uh, to the monthly download series as we've uh, collaborated with guests from uh, the CSCMP Rocky Mountain Roundtable uh, to bring uh, uh, Dr. Zach Rogers and his logistics managers index to the Denver Transportation Download. Um, the DTC download is the Denver Transportation Club's monthly event to engage and our, our current and future membership. And we're so happy for you all to, to, uh, to join us here as we continue to, to the, this momentum, uh, building on this new event for our, our community uh, and members. Uh, my name is Will Burdeck. I'm the co-VP of activities for the club. And uh, for those who are not familiar with our organization, uh, Denver Transportation Club was formed in 1906 and exists to cultivate good fellowship, promote the mutual and educational interests of its members, and to stimulate interest on the part of the public in transportation matters. And with more than 150 active members, we pride ourselves on being the premier group to engage with the front range supply chain community. Uh, so thanks to all our, all our supporting members and the board that serves with me, and especially our corporate sponsors. Uh, just to name some of our corporate sponsors, uh, we have BM2 Freight, obviously here today. Uh, we've got Kodiak, Acme, Loadsmith, DIX, RMT, XPO, Allen Lund, Uber, Uber Freight, uh, Box Wheel, Universal Chain, Lobo Logistics, Assured Partners, USI, Mountain Valley Logistics, and ISEC. So one of the benefits of being a corporate member is spotlighting during the download. Uh, so this week, we have the honor of welcoming John Graham with BM2 Freight, along with Zach Rogers, Assistant Professor of Supply Chain Management at CSU. John also serves on the board of the, Rocky Ma of the CSCMP Rocky Mountain Roundtable. Uh, and John's a, a freight veteran with 20 plus years in the transportation industry and gets up every day to provide his clients with the best possible experience with their truckload needs. Uh, so John will be spotlighting BM2 Freight and we'll also introduce uh, Zach Rogers and the Logistics Managers Index as we get kicked off here in just a minute. Uh, last kind of housekeeping items before we get started and I hand things off to John and Zach. Uh, so we are still busy planning upcoming events for the fall and winter. Uh, so we, we are uh, still looking at, at setting up another golf tournament in September, October timeframe uh, and a new spin on our operation stimulus uh, here this winter. So more information to come out on that soon. Um, we're also looking at uh, you know, getting, so, uh, starting to get some membership happy hours going. And uh, so hopefully we'll be able to get together with some of you folks here in the, the near future. Um, <clears throat> we'll be have a survey as well as the recording available after the event. And and uh, for questions, you know, we've got plenty of time for Q&A today. So, uh, you know, type your questions in the chat, raise a hand, or, or just, um, or just yeah, feel, feel free to unmute and jump in. So, John, I'll uh, hand it off to you to take it from here. All right, yeah, thanks, Wilbur. And welcome to Zach's Corner. Um, as Wilbur said, this is something we originated with our CSC local roundtable, uh, Rocky Mountain Roundtable. Uh, we've taken a kind of hiatus for the summer months, uh, non-complicated reasons, but we were able to collaborate with, uh, you know, DTC uh, on this event with, with like-minded folks, right? Our, really, our mission was to, you know, share relevant content as it relates to transportation markets and markets to support that, right? Um, and what better information than the logistics manager index, right? So we really embraced that and... Who are we sharing this with, right? Other like-minded transportation, logistics, and supply chain professionals as we really kind of plan and hypothesize what's going to happen in the future and what's today and bring that back to our, you know, immediate job. So super fortunate to, um, you know, partner with Zach. It wouldn't be Zach's Corner without Zach. Um, he's the assistant uh, professor of supply chain management at Colorado State University. So when I hear that, I was like, okay, he, he may know something about this, right? A little bit, but I will, um, what was I gonna say? I wanted to shout out to, to BM2 Freight, uh, you know, their support and sponsorship for this event today just kind of echoes our core values and having a pulse on the market so we can bring those 
um, back to our, our customers as well as our, our, our carrier partners. Well, having said as much, you know, Wilbur, you did point out we're going to do some Q&A. So I think type them in, but we'll probably leave time at the end, however long they may be. I know we have an hour. Um, so it sounds like we should have, you know, ample time to have a good discussion uh, about the insights and uh, updates for this last month's LMI. Uh, so having said so much, uh, I'll transition over to Zach for, um, you know, Zach's corner. All right. Well, uh, well, well, thank you, John. Uh, I, I appreciate being invited to come talk to everybody. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's the last week of, of summer uh, here at, at Colorado State, and I, I was getting bored. And so it sounded great <laughs> to just come and talk to people about some trucks and some warehouses, and, and uh, it sounded like a lot of fun. So, um, and as, as John mentioned, there's something that we've been doing with, with uh, the CSCMP group, and, and I talk a, a couple other places about, um, about the, uh, the LMI every, every month as well. And, and, uh, and I have some slides, and, and uh, John, are you the host? Um, I am the host, though you oh. should be able to share your screen. Let's see. It says I'm a, a host is disabled participant screen sharing. Gotcha. Okay, let me so, make that for that you is here. Probably my fault for getting on 30 seconds uh, before the call started, <laughs> but you know, I I try not to just teach JIT in my classes. I try to live my life that way, also. Uh, so I. <laughs> rarely early to this kind of thing uh all right john it says you're the host now yeah can you uh enable screen sharing here i can do it here or whoever so there we go change host thank you for your patience oh i am the host now oh now right. you're the host there you go wow i I am the captain now. Great. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, hopefully everybody can can see that uh, that that screen there. So, um, welcome everybody. I'm I'm happy to talk about the uh, the logistics managers index uh, with all of you today. Now, um, in case some of you haven't uh, heard of us before or, or what it is we do, I thought I'd put a quick slide here at the top um, to kind of show everybody what what the LMI is. So the LMI. Uh, Logistics Managers Index is a monthly diffusion index that we put out every month. Usually we have a, a couple hundred um, managers and usually we, we, we try to get director, uh, well, we, we do have mostly director level and above. Um, and, and the reason for that is because we're asking people a lot of sort of big, you know, 20,000 foot view of the firm uh, sort of metrics. Uh, when I was a lowly uh, warehouse manager uh, at Amazon. I, I knew what our inventory levels looked like. I had no idea what transportation capacity was or anything like that. So we asked direct levels and above. And essentially what we do is this is the, you're looking at the whole survey right here, basically. It's it's very simple. We also ask about future stuff and some demographic things. But this is the meat and, and potatoes of it. And we ask about eight different metrics. We ask, okay, okay inventory levels, inventory costs. And then for warehousing and transportation, we ask about price utilization and capacity, and that's it. And we say, compared to last month, is it going down, staying the same, or is it going up? And we put all that together to create a diffusion index, okay? So when you average everything together, essentially any number above 50 means growth. And the further above 50 it is, the greater the level of growth. Any number below 50 means contraction, further below 50 it is, the greater the level of contraction, okay? So right here, we're looking at just the last two years uh, of readings. We've been doing this for about uh, about five years. Um, and you can see that this month we got a 74 and a half. That is the third highest reading uh, in the history of, of the index. The second highest reading was last month. And we also tied for the third highest uh, uh, two months ago in May, three months ago in May. And, um, and so if you just put these last three months together, it's the fastest growth we've seen for any sort of quarter um in the five years we've been doing this and I, and I think it's it's really interesting actually to see the sort of level of of growth and, and if you talk to people in the industry it makes sense this has felt like a busy last three months I think for everybody uh and in this month in particular uh this was really driven by uh growth in in warehousing uh specifically warehousing costs as well as inventory and, and transportation. Warehousing costs, so I think we had our, our highest mark ever. Um, and, and I think this is helpful for a number of reasons. One, it comes out monthly, so it's, it's fairly current. And two, 
it can really help us to understand what's sort of coming down the pike. You know, it's it's a uh, We've, we've done actually some academic papers using this sort of uh, this, uh, this metric, this index to predict sort of future economic variables. So looking at things like, you know, Dow Jones index, unemployment rate, retail sales, the July LMI is a really strong, like 90% predictor of the August economy, okay? And when we started this, the idea was to do sort of a, a PMI, a purchasing managers index for the 21st century. You know, when they put together the purchasing managers index in, at Michigan State in the 60s, they made it about manufacturing. And that made a lot of sense in 1963 or whenever uh, Professor Fearon was, was coming up with it. That made sense in 1963. When we started this in 2016, you know, we thought maybe manufacturing isn't the best gauge of, of the US economy, right? We're about service and uh, logistics and delivery. And we might have a better idea of what sales are gonna be if instead of looking at, okay, how many goods are we producing? Looking at how many goods we're moving around. Are they sitting in inventories? Are they in warehouses that are in trucks, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, uh, you know, based on our analysis has been a pretty strong predictor of, of you know, sort of next month's activity. Um, by the way, if anyone wants to jump in with questions at any time, um, fine to just answer it you know i'm i i appreciate talking to you guys because normally i talk to 19 year olds who've never heard of any of this before uh so so talking to you guys is always great so any any notes comments questions anything i'm, I'm happy to stop at any point all right so let's kind of bump forward here so i i kind of have made this sort of a high level uh presentation because i wanted to leave a lot of time to, to talk at the end um this is a graph though that we use in last month's report, and it shows aggregate movement for uh, price, logistics price, and logistics capacity. So all of our capacity metrics together, all of our, our price metrics together, normalized so that they're on the same scale. And anything below this sort of dash black line indicates contraction. Anything above it indicates growth, okay? So, uh, you know, anything above 150, or below 150, and the scale goes from zero to 300. All right, so if we look at this time two years ago, uh, aggregate price was a 186, aggregate capacity was a 173. There's a 15 point spread between these guys. Now, so what that means basically is we were having a pretty moderate level of growth. 170, 150, or 180, 170, those are both within one standard deviation of the mean. That's just like normal levels of growth we're having in 2019. And if you remember at this time in 2019, things were actually kind of slow on the industrial side, right? B to C, things, you know, the, the consumer was hot, retail was hot. We had some slowdowns on the industrial side, maybe partly some trade war stuff, some hangover from sort of the peaks that we had in, in late 2017, early 2018, just sort of normal business cycles. We go forward, uh, and it's pretty easy to see, by the way, if you were just looking at this graph and someone said, hey, what was the month that the world got turned upside down? I bet <laughs> even if you knew nothing else, I bet you could tell, oh, was it right here? Yeah, it was, it was right there. <laughs> it was exactly right there. The, the one month where kind of capacity went up a little bit. And then since then, it's just been a, a huge divergence where now we've seen aggregate capacity has contracted since May of 2020. So we're now at like, set, uh, what is that, 14 months of contraction. And something I, I should have pointed out earlier, all of these numbers are relative to the previous month, okay? So like on that last that last uh, slide where we saw, okay, we went from 75 to 74.5, that doesn't mean that logistics is smaller or has contracted in any way from last month. Anything over 50 is growth. All we're talking about here is slow. So it's still gone up, right? The logistics industry still got busier from June to July. It's just maybe the slope uh, tilted down just a little bit, okay? So that, that's what we're looking at here. So capacity has been contracting for more than a year. And we're starting to see, I think, an aggregate sort of marginal increase, a marginal increase for every decrease in capacity. And essentially what I mean now is for every little bit that capacity, available capacity shrinks, 
price goes up sort of on a, a sort of exponential curve, right? It's not a one-to-one. -one. And it's partly because I think we've been doing this for so long that we're starting to see it's just, you know, for every little bit hurts a little bit more. And, and I think it, the July numbers are, are really interesting because we we're at a 15.3 spread two years ago. Now it's 153 points. It is literally an exact 10X jump in terms of the spread between available capacity uh, and, and prices. Okay, now I should also point out, this does not mean that there's less trucks or less warehouses than there were two years ago. There's more trucks and more house warehouses than there were two years ago. It's just that we're using so many more of them than we, than we were before. You know, if you think about e-commerce, Normally we go up 15% a year. In 2020, we went up by 40%. And so we essentially went forward three years in terms of our demand for like last mile uh, e-commerce delivery in about nine months. And it's just gonna take us a, a long time to, to dig out of those holes. You know, tender rejection rates keep going up, but also total, uh, total loads moved and, and total tonnage moved keeps going up as well. So essentially what we're seeing is we're building as quickly as we can we just can't get supply to keep up with, with demand. And I would assume, Wilbur, Asa, you guys are, are probably seeing the same things, very similar things. All right. So the thing about what's going on right now is that it really goes all the way back uh, through the supply chain. This is a, uh, a little screenshot. I, I get an email every day from the Port of Los Angeles because I'm a cool guy. Uh, who, who likes fun things. And, uh, and so this is uh, what their predicted TEUs coming in uh, for the next, the next couple of weeks are. And you can see, right? So I just showed you those graphs, right? I just showed you that graph that said, you know, we are just growing as fast as we can in terms of price. You were at 267, it only goes up to 300. So 267 is pretty close to as, as hot as we could be growing. And, and capacity has been, contracting relative to demand for over a year. That, those are the numbers from July. July is not traditionally the hottest time of the year. I mean, outside maybe, but, but not for the freight market. The hottest time of the year is coming now. And you can look at TEUs moving from mid-August to late August. We're gonna be up another, and remember last year we were already insane at this time. We're going to be 56% higher in late August, early September than we were at this time a year ago. Things are going to be moving really, really quickly. And that's reflected, if we look at, this is the Fredos uh, container index. This is uh, moving from China to the West Coast. This week, it's $15,800 for a container moving from China to the West Coast. This is actually down. Last week, it was $18,500. So, you know, now it's, now it's just a cool 15,000, no big deal. Um, but, but still, even with that, that decrease, this is up over 100% from like June 1, right? In June 1, it was 8,000 bucks. In September of last year, it was 3,000. So we've quintupled, which is a word you don't get to use a lot. We've quintupled from this time, uh, from this time last year. Now, this is big problems, by the way, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, the, the average value of a container, the contents of a container is somewhere between 50 and $100,000. That makes sense when the container costs 3,000. When the container costs 15,000 or 20,000, suddenly now, instead of talking about, oh, you know, 3% of value or 6% of value, we're talking 30% of the value of the container, of what's in the container is just the metal box itself. So there's going to be, real ramifications from this, um, I think in, in a lot of different ways that, that we haven't really seen yet. But the reason this looks like this, the reason this is so backed up is because we've had a container shortage for a while. And now we're really starting to see, I think, bad behavior from carriers uh, going to ports. You know, if you think about the way shipping works between the US and China, normally it's we come from China, go to Long Beach, unload, drive up to Oakland, reload with whatever we're shipping, agricultural commodities, scrap metal, cardboard, whatever it is we're sending there, and then goes back to China, right? It's kind of a card, it's kind of a triangle. Well, because everything is so backed up in China, 
And because the margins for carriers are so much better going east to west than west to east, a lot of them are just going straight back from LA or Long Beach. And so we are actually seeing, you know, sort of that, that third stop in, in San Francisco, Oakland, where they're going to load back up and bring stuff back to, to China. That's not going uh, as quickly as it was before because it's faster. Look, if I'm going to have to wait two weeks in Oakland anyway to reload, I could be halfway back to China with a, a, a more valuable load coming back. Now, one of the problems is with that is you don't want to go back to China with as many containers as you came over with if they're all empty because that gets pretty light, right? And then you start losing containers. Plus, you don't want to wait that long anyway. You don't want to wait. I mean, if, if I'm bringing them back empty anyway, I don't need to wait to load up the whole boat. Just give me 80% and I'll go back. And so because of the container shortage in China is creating so much, uh, such margin for these shipping companies, they're just leaving containers all over the place, making the container problem worse. Okay. And so the issues are creating bad behavior that, that makes the issues worse. It's sort of creating this negative feedback loop where the high prices of containers are making it so there's less containers, which then increase the price of containers again. And, and so we're having this sort of feedback loop. So what's happening here is we're getting this crazy, crazy congestion in the port of LA. I mean, we still, I, I think I looked today, one of the other the little stats they sent me is how many uh, ships are docked. I think it was 21 are, are docked off, off the port today, just waiting to, to get unloaded. By the way, on an average day, there's, there's you know, 12 ships in the port. So there's 12 plus another 21 outside right now. Um, and so what's happening is we're having all these containers then stack up that we can't even totally, we, we can't even get them on the trade. I mean, you guys know BNSF and Union Pacific uh, started metering traffic this month. And so, I mean, I think BNSF had a whole month where they just didn't accept any new, uh, any new loads. They're like, hey, we got to dig out of our, our back order. And so we have all these containers piling up. The Inland Empire right now, warehouse capacity, uh, or sorry, warehouse vacancy is, I think, one, one and a half percent right now in the Inland Empire. Because basically what we're doing is like, well, we'll just, we can't put it on a train. We'll just put it on a truck and just put these full containers just in warehouses close to the port. And then we'll send them somewhere else later. You also see more traffic going through Seattle and, and all the way around on the East Coast and all kinds of things. And, and, you know, I mean, you go through Chicago right now, I think it'll take a train two or three days to get through Chicago just because of, of what a traffic jam, just the insane congestion. All right. Um, and so all of this stuff, all of these issues, like, oh, there's not enough truck drivers. Okay, that's, that, that's part of it. Oh, there's not enough trucks. That, that's part of it. But also, this goes all the way back. This goes all the way back to the other side of the world. And sort of the problems are so systemic, I think, right now. It's going to take a while uh, for us to turn it around. Now, one, I think, a little slice of this, where we can see that there really is differences in different parts of supply chains, is this next slide here, where we, every month, we look at the up versus downstream response, okay? So, Upstream, which is the uh, the blue bars on this graph, orange is, is uh, or sorry, yeah, and orange is downstream. Upstream firms would be like manufacturers, distributors, wholesalers. Or uh, the downstream, the orange bars, that's like retailers. Basically, anyone who is customer facing, that is a downstream firm, okay? And for the most part, we see similar rates of growth all over the place. There are some differences though. One of them would be, inventory costs okay upstream the inventory costs are nine points higher growing not grow, or growing at a nine point faster rate than they are for their downstream counterparts which is statistically uh significant using some some t-tests and all this stuff um i think this is interesting because it plays into what we were just talking about all of this inventory is stuck upstream i've talked to so many retailers or or end product users who are like i just can't get components I just can't get product. And it's not that there's no product being made. It's that the product is stuck. I mean, the system is essentially constipated, I think, for, for lack of a, of a better term. Uh, <laughs> it's just everything is just jammed up right now. And so all these upstream firms, because we can't move things to transportation, are seeing, I mean, a 92 for, for, uh, for inventory costs. That's, again, this scale only goes up to 100. So a 92 is basically 
the highest level of growth. If, if this was isolated by itself, this would be the highest metric we, we'd ever tracked or the highest reading we'd ever tracked this metric is 92. That's what the upstream firms are feeling right now. In 82, by the way, or 83, that's also like nothing to sneeze at. That's well, well above average. I think average of this metric is like 64. Uh, but, but even what the downstream folks are feeling is nothing compared to everything being stuck upstream. Now flip that on the other side and look at capacity. Well, downstream, their available uh, transportation capacity is contracting 20 points faster than it is for the upstream, okay? So upstream 41, still significant levels of contraction, but a 21 is like crazy, insane levels of, of contraction that we've really never seen before. And essentially what this is showing is, look, the inventory is stuck up here and we're trying to get it moving as fast as we can. And then downstream, we're having real problems getting it to the end consumer, or maybe we're talking about getting it from our supplier to us. Both of these are factored in there. Um, but you know, as, as we have all this increased levels of, of at-home delivery and, and returns and all kinds of things, that sort of last mile has never really been more, more expensive than it is now. And then that sort of second to last mile that let's get it from the supplier to our fulfillment center is really, really tough. That's really tough right now to, to get any traction on. And so I think it's interesting, all the, all the, all the inventories upstream and then all of the issues with movement are happening downstream. All right. So any, hey, Zach, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, and you, 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 you know, if you read the LMI uh, updates, you talk about just in time, JIT. Yeah. Right. And, I feel like over the last decade, you know, supply chain professionals were able to really help reduce costs in inventory um, due to just-in-time models because transportation was you know, available and, you know, reasonably, um, you know, cost-effective. And then when we rebounded last year, I feel like people were solving their supply chain problems with transportation, right, which is super expensive and, again, not sustainable I mean, I just feel like, you know, we're, we're starting to see this monumental shift. We're like, hey, this, we're going to have to make that, you know, pretty significant changes in our model from just in time to holding inventory mm -hmm. because we can no longer, you know, survive. Is that okay, kind of what you're... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I was just kind of making an observation, you know, until, you know, the market balances out, we probably won't see that trend going back to just in time. I mean, holistically, right? I mean, there's still... Right you know, plenty of industries that still function that way, which you know, they can take advantage of it, but holistic. Oh, I agree. And, and you know, it's interesting. Two of the, the industries that I would most associate with just in time, right? Uh, sort of auto manufacturing and grocery have both actively moved away from, from JIT in the last year. Like if you look at the mix of fruits and vegetables with grocery, they've gone way heavier towards frozen than just, just sort of fresh fruit and vegetables because of the issues with, with getting things moving. Also, people are cooking at home more and we all feel comf more comfortable with like frozen broccoli, I think, than, than using regular <laughs> broccoli. Um, but, but they've moved and they have these things like one of my, my good friends works at Kroger and she told me, oh, we, we're stocking a bunch of pandemic pallets just in case Delta comes back. We have a ton of stuff just ready to go uh, in case people have to start uh, you know, cooking more at home and stuff. Look at the auto industry. Toyota outsold GM in the second quarter in the U.S. for the first time ever. Toyota's never outsold in, in the U.S. GM for a quarter. They did this year. And it's purely because they stockpiled semiconductors at the end of last year and GM doesn't have any. GM is selling every car and every truck they can get on the lot. They just can't get very many on the lot, uh, especially relative to, to Toyota. And, and I think, John, it, it's such an interesting thing. And, and I'm actually... I'm teaching this, this exec ed class in December and I'm going to, I'm doing like, just like four hours on JIT. So it's, so it's going to be a barn burner. Uh, but, uh, it, but, but it's about that debate um, where you're absolutely right. We built this system on these assumptions that we can make something 5,000 miles away and get it here for relatively cheap and at a very predictable, relatively quick uh, rate, right? Okay. Buy something from China. The container, I'm going to know exactly what's going to be on the boat, and the container's going to cost me 3000 bucks. Well, now that container costs $15,000, and I might get on the boat 10 weeks after I was supposed to. And so it's interesting. Right now, the value proposition that we're seeing in international logistics is like, hey, 
what if I give you a quarter of the service for five times the price? Would you be interested in that? Well, now some companies are thinking, are, what, are we? Are, is, that, is that actually what we want to do? And so I do think we are seeing this shift where, and then of course, because, because service is so bad, oh, I'm just going to order double or triple because I don't know when I'm going to get another shipment in. I do think we're seeing this sort of revaluation and, and in some ways, you know, people have been talking about nearshoring and reshoring manufacturing. And, you know, you're never going to reshore, say, a sock factory in Ohio, right? Like that's not coming back. Not that I think we'd want a sock factory necessarily, but I do think we are going to see more sort of Pan-American supply chains emerge over the next 10 years sort of as a reaction for this, which by the way, if I was someone in trucking or rail, that would sound great to me because now we can move things quickly just up and down, right? It's almost like if, if I was, if, 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 if Biden called me up and said, hey, uh, we need a logistics are, um, we also maybe need help with other stuff, but let's say we just, just for you, we, we want logistics are, and said, what would we do? I'd say, you know, a one belt, one road, China style initiative, that goes from Canada to say Brazil, that would be the way to go, I think. Uh, and it's because we are seeing this crazy capacity crunch and we're gonna have to reinvest and rebuild all this stuff anyway at this point. We might as well make one that's close to us. And I think we're really seeing that maybe relying, especially for like semiconductors, you know, that's, we, we have record back orders of class eight trucks right now because we can't have the semiconductors, we can't build phones, we can't build computers. It does seem like people are starting to think, hey, you know, having one company in Taiwan, 5,000 miles away, make two thirds of the world semiconductors may not be the bulletproof plan that we, that we had once thought it was. And so I, I think it'll be really interesting. And I do think the other part of that is people are going to rethink JIT a little bit, especially, you know, look at how we've reimagined the rest of the supply chain. Think about how warehouses used to be. When I uh, went to work at, at Amazon in 2010, I worked in um, one of the first warehouses ever built right outside of, of Reno, Nevada. It's halfway between Fernley and, and Reno, Nevada. And, um, and on my first day, it's out in the middle of nowhere. On my first day to work, I was late. Uh, and I was nervous. This is 2010, like the recession. Like I was really freaked out. I was late because uh, I was right down the street and then six bulls came into the road. Uh, like big, like wild ones with, with horns and stuff. Now these are... I know maybe, I don't know if some of you guys growing up in Colorado, you have one idea of what maybe a bull or a cow looks like. The ones who live in Nevada are just eating sagebrush and, and broken dreams. They're, they're hungry and they're angry and they're mean. And, uh, and I was 15 minutes late to work because I just had to wait for these bulls to get off the road. Now, why is that? It's because they were building warehouses out in the middle of nowhere. When, you know, because this, this is one of their early ones, everything was about cost. Everything was about how can we lower costs as much as possible? Think about an Amazon warehouse now it's in like Thornton across the street from the mall, across the street from two malls. That's where they build them now. Why is that? That's way more expensive. Well, it's because they care about service levels. And so the same way I think we've sort of seen supply chain shift locally and go from this cost reduction model to this high service model, I think we could see the same thing start to happen on a more macro level. So I th is, does that answer your question, John? Yeah, and several more, as <laughs> always. <laughs> but yeah, I'm always, um, I'm always good for a 10 minute answer for a 30 second question. <laughs> um, so I guess I say, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we beat the hell out of that subject. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I Cool. Well, let me let me show you a couple more pictures. Then we can we can talk about whatever else you guys you guys want to talk about. Um, this picture here is a, a picture of sort of what's going on with a lot of the other non transportation metrics um, in the uh, in in the um, the report this month. And you can see here we have inventory levels. That's the gray the gray line. Warehouse capacity is green. Um, inventory cost is the yellow line and warehousing prices is, is the red line. And, and I like this one just because, again, it goes back to that idea of the marginal cost growth curve that we were talking about, where, okay, that gray line, inventory levels has been growing fairly steadily, but, but it can't get that high. 
like it hasn't cracked 70 really during the entire pandemic yet inventory costs at yellow line are higher than they've ever been we we had never had a reading in the 80s uh before january of 21 so this year and since then every reading has been in the 80s our, our all-time high we almost cracked 90 uh, uh last month and we're still right at 88 85 or 88.5 um and so i think it's interesting because what that tells us is, okay, we can't build inventories up, but it's moving through really quickly. And so this is a picture of that gray line and that yellow line together tell us, a, a, I think, a story of inventory velocity. We have a lot of inventory, but that's not sticking around. It's moving really, really quickly. And because it's moving so quickly, we see these really high costs reflected in the yellow line. Warehousing, something similar. It's been contracting, but contracting at a pretty steady rate the thing, though, to remember, though, is that's not just because that green line is flat doesn't mean that warehouse contraction is flat. It's just been like this for a long time. OK, it's been contracting at the same sort of steady rate right around 40 uh, for basically the last year. We had one month where we showed uh, where we, we saw some increase in warehouse capacity. It was August 2020. And this right here was a 50.5. If we would have had you know, 10 more people say it was going down and we, <laughs> we would have probably been back below the black line. And, um, and so it's been contracting for a while. And because of that, we see this red line again, just growing like crazy. Like I said, we hit our all time high number this month at 88 and warehousing really, the fact that warehousing is up so much, I think shows us how sort of dire this has been because with, with transportation, you know, transportation goes up and down. Transportation is very dynamic in terms of prices. Spot rates are changing every single day. For warehouses, you're signing a three-year contract. One year, maybe one year, maybe, or you know, maybe you could get some spot market thing around Christmas or whatever, but most of you're signing long-term contracts. So prices don't change quickly. Capacity also tends to not change quickly either because it takes a long time to build warehouses and to use them up. And so the fact that we now, over the last, just in 2021, have seen this rise so sharply. And we can even go back to say a year ago. So from here, it was what, mid 60s, and now we're at 88. In the last year, warehousing prices have started to act like transportation prices. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing all of this cost increase in the supply chain. You know, people keep, I keep seeing all these people in like the New York Times or whatever, trying to figure out where all this inflation is coming from. I wish they would just ask. I mean, it's right here. It's, it's, it's this graph right here. It's this red line is where all this, this inflation is coming from. And then also maybe the transportation stuff too. Um, and so I, I think it's really interesting to, to look at this and, and to sort of understand it. And again, see, because it's gone for so long, those marginal costs will keep, keep increasing. Okay. Now, I don't want to just come here and have this just be darkness hour. Uh, with with Zach, okay. So I do want to to show you something that I I think does give a little hope. So the other thing we asked, the last question we asked on the survey is, hey, uh, twelve months from now, where do you see all these metrics going? Okay. So this is over the next year, what's going to happen to all all eight of the metrics? And transportation capacity became positive this month in July, the July report for the first time, I think in 2021 and in, in the first time in a while. Warehouse capacity is up a little bit too. And so respondents are actually saying, hey, you know what? It, it might be a little looser in a year. Now, it's, that doesn't mean we're gonna be out of the woods in a year. You can see those are both in the like low to mid fifties. So that's very moderate, sort of modest rates of growth and prices are still gonna be up in the, the, high, to, the high 80s for inventory warehousing low 80s for, for transportation, okay? And so essentially what I'm, what I'm hoping this means, and, and it's, it's now sort of a couple months in a row of, of something similar, I think what this maybe is indicating is that in terms of the capacity, the la absolute lack of capacity, we've hit the bottom, okay? We, you know, in terms of, of raw, we might be on our way slowly back up. Now, this could be totally thrown off in September when we are ramping up for Christmas. Okay. So take that with a grain of salt, but it seems like what our respondents are telling us, and our respondents have actually been very 
accurate in terms of their future predictions. Uh, if you throw out March and April of 2020, when they didn't expect uh, the world to end, if you throw those two months out, they've actually been very, very accurate over the five years of doing this. Um, and, uh, and so basically it shows things are coming back online. And you can even see, right, class eight trucks. In I think in 2020, we made 210,000. This year, we're gonna make 250,000. Next year, it'll be over 300,000. We're ramping up warehouse. We're, we're so, so there is, so you, we do see anecdotally sort of all this increased, uh, increased sort of physical capital is sort of starting to come back online and maybe we can build up and up. Now, a question I get sometime is, well, are we gonna overbuild? Are we worried about, you know, building up too much and then it's kind of a beer, be a bullet effect. And, and I would say us worrying about overbuilding right now is like the guy who goes to the gym for the first time is like, I don't want to get too big. I don't want to be too, I, I like, don't worry about it. <laughs> that we can cross that bridge when we get there. Uh, the other thing I would point out is, you know, e-commerce has been a, a big driver of like at least the transportation crunch. Right now it's 13% of retail is e-commerce, 13 and percent of retail. By 2025, it'll be 26% of retail. So in the next four years, that's going to double anyway. So I don't actually think we should be too worried about overbuilding on, on the warehousing side right now. And trucks, you know, trucks really the constraint might end up, or is semiconductors and drivers more than anything else. Um, and so as long as we can sort of stay within those limits, I, I think we'll be okay. Um, so that is, uh, that is kind of my, my, my presentation here. Uh, so uh, the last thing I, I'll say before we, we, we pop it up for questions, this is our website, uh, thelmi.com. Uh, you see all of our old reports are up there. It's free, by the way. Okay, we write this report for free. This is what you call a terrible business model where I just <laughs> spend a couple of days writing this report every month. And I just, you know, I'm, I, we just want people to know what's going on. Um, uh, and if you would, are interested, by the way, and get on the mailing list, or maybe you think, hey, I should be one of the people that's telling you what's going on in supply chain, and you want to be part of our, our respondent group, send me an email at, at zach.rogers at, at colostate.edu, and I'll be happy to jump on a, a Zoom with you, talk to you, and, and we can get you set up uh, uh, to, be, to be one of our respondents, if, if that's something you're interested into, and, and put whoever you want from your companies on our, our mailing list. I, I promise we're nice. We only send it out once. Uh, and then maybe we'll send a reminder to take it at the end of the month, but we're not going to, you know, spam you to death. Um, all right. So that, that's it for me. Uh, and we left, uh, 14 minutes. So any questions or comments or anything you guys want to talk about? I'm, I'm happy to do it. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. Um, looks like we have one uh, question in here. It says, um, when in your opinion, do you see the market going in the other direction? When do you think rates will contract or stabilize? Right. So a lot of that is a, is a function of, of capacity. And like we saw, especially for transportation, capacity is, is way, way sort of down right now. And so I think it'll be a while. And, and again, part of it, part of the bottleneck is, um, is uh, you know, the, the semiconductor issue. Okay, and so until we can really get the semiconductors where we can get the class eight trucks online, we're not going to build up the type of capacity we need. And semiconductors, that's probably something like 2023 is, I think, when we're looking at, at really getting some of those back online. You know, I, I put another uh, sort of chart here in backup slides that I think talks about this a little bit. Um, we're, we're good. Some of our, our good friends at, uh, at the LMI are, are uh, freight waves. Who I'm sure you guys are all, all familiar with. I, I go on the Freight Economic Show usually once a month, and uh, and they're they're good friends of ours. This I I pulled uh, from their Sonar platform, and you can see the outbound tender rejection index uh, in the U.S. and and right now, right this blue line is is us right now. This is sort of you know June to December where we're going, and and you can really see if we look at the orange line. This is uh, I think twenty. 19 no this is 2018 or sorry green is 2018 orange is 2019 here and uh and you can see it was like you know around this time it was around five percent uh in in 2018 and even in 2019 wasn't bad but it but then you look what happened now okay well this is when it really started going crazy and we were at 25 percent almost the whole second half of last year now just so we all remember what that means 
that means for every four potential loads that can go on a truck, three are getting rejected. Okay. Or sorry, sorry, three are getting accepted. One, one is getting rejected. That the other way would be insane. Three, three are getting accepted. One's getting rejected. And right now we're at what? 21%. And we had been at 25 for a lot of the year. And I would guess that we're going to climb back up again. And so we were already sort of, I think, even if you just look at the orange line, I think you can see we're trending to a place where we were starting to catch up. And then we just got thrown into this sort of tailspin, you know, here, basically. And, and the, the thing of it is, is we're going to continue to have regular levels of growth, right? So we, we jumped in a big hole and we're not going to, it's going to take us longer to get out of the hole because as we're sort of digging our way out, the holes, you know, we still have the regular level of growth on top of it. And so what we're trying to do is basically, let's say we, we got pushed a year back. And really, I think it's, we got closer to pushed a year and a half back. Okay. It's not going to take us a year and a half to catch up because we still have the regular growth we'd have on top of that. Plus we have all these constraints uh, like, like semiconductors that's, that's slowing us down. So in terms of when is the market going to flip back? And, and uh, cause I, I, if I were, cause I get right. We had this big growth in the first half of 2018. And then the second half of 2018, you know, tr trucking companies start closing down. Right. I mean, even in like February of, of 2020, where like every you'd open up the, the Wall Street Journal and be like, oh, yeah, another small regional 3PL closed down and because they way over invested. This is different. This I you know, I, I think right now what we're seeing is the big bounce off of sort of the the, the big contraction. Right. It's not like we're going to go way up and then come all the way back down. I think we already went down. And now we're on our way up and, and there might be some slight decrease, but, but the scale of whatever that contraction is going to be. And I think that's probably four or five years down the road is going to be a lot smaller than the scale of the growth that we're seeing right now. Hey, Zach, I've got a question. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Hey, so, you know, first of all, really, really good insight. I think for probably many of us, uh, one way or another being in the logistics industry, you know, it's kind of like we, we know all of these pieces, but from my standpoint, you know, I'm not focused on all the different components of it. So right. looking at this just helps put things into perspective, but, you know, I think to, you know, to your point, right. You know, you're talking about, you know, kind of the challenges around ports. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, the, uh, I think you're, you're, reference it as being constipated, you're spot on, right? So you end up in a situation where you're having to get all these containers out of the ports, you know? So I think to your point, you've got transportation, drainage companies, pulling all these containers, um, putting them in warehouses. Um, but I guess what jumps out at me with that and um, is a lot of this goes back to, to labor, right? And you're, and you're spot on, right? So it's like, we don't have enough containers. We don't have um, but enough warehouses built, uh, not enough trucks built, all those types of things. But, you know, one of the biggest challenges is, is the labor component. Oh, right. And absolutely. You know, we, we do business with, uh, you know, the top two grocery retailers in, in the United States and the labor piece is real, you know, when you start looking at whether it's containers, drops, all those types of things sitting in the yard, that stockpile continues to increase and at mm -hmm. times feels like there's no, you know, there's no end in sight. So for me, I mean, everything goes in balance. And I think to, you know, to, to Pete's question, like, Hey, when's the market going to bounce back? Um, yeah. There's, there's several large factors and labor has got to be right in the forefront. Of no, you know, I, I, I totally agree with you, uh, Joe. And, and uh, I think it's, it's interesting um, I saw a report this morning. Um, uh, the unemployment rate right now for warehouse workers is much higher than it is for uh, other other parts of the of the country. So I think right now it's like five point four percent for the country, uh, but for warehouse workers it's like uh, you know ten in, in some in some markets. Like Dallas is really really bad right now. Um, and, and then it's, you know, lower in other places, but I think it's really, really interesting that warehousing is, is slower in some ways. And now the, the, the key part of that is 
there's more warehouse workers than there were at this time last year at the aggregate level. It's just it so many more of these jobs have come on. And then also, if you look in the space, right, we have Walmart is now paying everybody 15 bucks. Amazon is paying, starting at 15, going up. And so I think in some ways, warehouse workers in particular have more options than they had a year ago. And just people are paying more. And it's, you know, people are going to just kind of follow, follow the, the wall. It's the other thing I think, you know, that's, that's really interesting with the, uh, the truck driving piece of this. Let me show you guys a, a, a graph here um, that, I, that I think is really interesting. It's uh, this one right here. And this is the, the short bound, uh, the short haul sort of outbound tender rejection rate. And so if we look at tender rejection rates, okay, so the short haul, it's only 16%. Local is like 7%. It's when you start getting up into the mid long hauls and stuff that you really see the high rejection rates coming through. And again, it's because of the type of labor that trucking companies are having trouble filling, right? Local haul, great. Truck companies are paying more than ever. I can be home tonight. I'm just driving around the city. That's great. You know, I, I grew up in, in Reno and, and after college, I worked in one of the casinos um, as I was in purchasing. Um, in, in, in Reno, you either work at a, a casino, a warehouse or a brothel. And I hit two of the three. Uh, and so um, <laughs> I, I was working in, and there was this one guy, he was the milk delivery guy who would come to the casino I worked at at 6 a.m. And he, I remember talking to him about his route one day. And he just did all the casinos in Reno. And then he went up around Lake Tahoe and all, all the casinos there. And Lake Tahoe is one of the most beautiful parts of the planet. And then was home every night by five o'clock. And I remember thinking, I would, I would be a truck driver if, if that was my route. Now, if I was going from, you know, Denver to uh, Boston or to Miami or Tampa or something, that would be less fun for me. And so I think, again, part of the labor is it's just what people want to do. You know, the days of of, you know, Convoy and, and uh, Burt Reynolds making it look cool to be a truck driver. I think that's over a little bit. And now it's, you know, this, these lines down here, that's what people want to do. Up here, that's where we're really running into the problems. And so I think part of, part of this is, you know, rethinking the way we have these, these networks laid out. Can we do sort of the relay routes, the shorter stuff to make this a, a more sort of appealing part, you know, kind of job? Because you know, it's clear that it's not just money, right? Because if you look at the average truck driver salary, we've thrown a lot of money at that over the last couple of years. That's not the factor. A lot of it, I think, is, is the lifestyle piece. Uh, and, and that's something that we're going to have to figure out as, as low decisions. And again, it's going away from that idea of, you know, everything is as efficient as possible to, hey, what service level? And, and, and in some ways, not just service level for the customers, but hey, for our employees, what is it that is really going to get them to be here and to stick around? Yeah, it's, it's interesting you say that. Uh, I was driving on 76 inbound from the great state of Nebraska. I went by a couple of yards and noticed the amount of over-the-road equipment that was parked. And that really just, you know, you have to ask yourself, you know, yeah, there's semiconductors, there's a back order on new equipment, but how much capacity is just parked right now? You can't get seats in there. And I think you're also seeing that kind of poaching you're seeing at the warehouse where, you know, you're getting a onboarding bonus. You're getting a, um, you know, more more money per mile from the next guy across the street. Um, and I think it's just, you know, supply and demand with transportation is probably not going to change, right, as it relates to market and condition. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to have to see a balance when it comes to the amount of tonnage that's going to be going over the road. And, and what is that going to look like in the supply chain models, you know, in a year? And I think that, you know, that's something that I'm trying to keep a pulse on too. So I'll challenge, I'll challenge you, Zach, to keep a pulse on that one with more bold predictions. Sounds good. Yeah. I mean, you know, the other problem with next, is, is next Zach's the, corner, right? Yeah. The, the ports were coming. You gotta, you gotta leave them one more. Uh, the, the ports <laughs> they're, they're coming into are, are changing too, right? New York, Newark, New Jersey. They've never, they've never had a busier summer. Savannah, Seattle, the, the, the outbound traffic out of Seattle right now is higher than it's ever been. And so not only are, is the demand changing, the place where demand is coming from is changing. And of course, that's going to be hard. You know, the carriers are just, they're only thinking, well, hey, the port will be less busy in Seattle. Okay, well, Seattle doesn't have the infrastructure for all the stuff that comes after that. 
And so I, I think we are going to see in, in some ways, maybe a sort of decentralization of some of the supply chain terms. You know, supply chain has always been, let's just drive scale as much as we can get. And, you know, economies to scope, distance, speed, scale. And now it's sort of like, well, we've seen what disruption does to you. Maybe having more of a portfolio approach to our supply chain. I mean, supply chain right now is like the guy who's only been buying GameStop for the last six months. I know that's, that worked for a while. It's not going to work forever. You got you to gotta diversify a little bit. And so I, I think that's part of what we're going to start to see in networks is a, a diversification, more of a portfolio approach. And maybe that can stop us from getting totally blown out of the water by one port, one factory, et cetera. Hmm. Okay. Good, good parting thoughts there. Um, oh, that was awesome, Zach. It's great to see all, all kind of all the different components, very, very different, um, you know, approach to looking at, you know, looking at the, um, you know, logistics and warehousing in general. So um, really enjoyed that. Thank you so much for, for being on here today with us and, and, uh, and John and BM2 Freight. Appreciate it. You guys as well. Yeah, Happy no, year. thanks for uh, thanks for having us. And uh, you know, I uh, I got a whole class of of advanced logistics students starting next week. And so, if, if any of you guys ever want to, you know, <laughs> come come talk to students, share insights. You know, we uh, you know one of the reasons we're doing this is because you know CSU wants to be uh, more involved uh, with the community than than we have. Been. You know, this this was a minor up until 2014. Uh, and, and now it's really, you know, we have, we have about 200 students now we're starting to grow and we're really getting to the point now where we want to be engaged, uh, especially with, with you guys down in Denver. So, uh, so we're, we're happy to do this and, and thanks, thanks for inviting me. Awesome. Oh, well, let's do it. All right. Appreciate it, everybody. Um, thanks again for, uh, for dialing in and, um, and participating here. So, and appreciate you, uh, Zach Rogers. Thank you, John, from uh, BM2 Freight. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Good evening. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care.